Next, we turn to the knight Sir Percival. Of the knights that accomplished the Grail quest, there is Percival, Bors, and Galahad, and then Lancelot, who is also deeply involved in the quest, of course. But the three that accomplish it are Percival, Bors, and Galahad. Percival himself has a history which bears some note. He is the young knight who comes from humble origins, and he is made a knight after seeing a knight on a horse. He's very impressed by the color and the brightness and the beauty of it all, and falls in love with all that the knighthood symbolizes and all that honor and nobility. And he himself goes out and gets red armor, and he wears red armor for most of his career, and so he comes to be known as the knight of the red armor. But Percival has always with him a very humble mentality. Although he loves the glory of the court and the, and the nobility of the court, much like Lancelot does, he doesn't strive for it. There's something almost, I would say, Zen-like if this were uh, Eastern philosophy. He, he, doesn't, um, he doesn't strive for it and therefore he gets it. And he is, he is uh, perpetually virgin. And that's important to note uh, in that he's never known a woman. He's never been with a woman. He's never been married. He's never had any relations with a woman. And consequently, this theme that has run through all of Mallory of how do men relate to women, how do women play into society, how do they part of society, becomes, I think, particularly important here. Uh, Percival treats women with the greatest dignity, the greatest uh, uh, courtesy but he doesn't desire from them anything carnal or anything of this world or anything mundane. He sees women as, in some ways, friends, compatriots. Um, he doesn't see them as uh, objects of desire. It's for this reason that he then, in this story, uh, achieves the grail through overcoming desire. And most of this story, the imagery involved in this story, has to do with the temptations, the carnal temptations, that Percival has to overcome. You know, if the story of the Grail is the story of human perfection, part of what Mallory seems to be positing is that each knight that accomplishes the Grail is accomplishing or mastering or overcoming some temptation away from human perfection. Percival's temptation seems to be the temptation to uh, break his, his chasteness, break his virginity, and to treat women as objects, to treat them as objects of desire, as Gowan does earlier in the story. Well, from early on, he meets with his aunt, and the aunt uh, has a, the title something like the, the Queen of, uh, of Poverty. The text says this about her. Some called me sometime the Queen of the Waste Lands, and I was called the Queen of Most Riches in the World, and it pleased me never my riches so much as doth my poverty. Then Sir Percival wept for pity, one that he knew it was his aunt. So his aunt now is the queen of the waste lands, the queen of poverty, whereas before she was the queen of riches when she was in the court. And now she's like an abbess. She has retreated from the world into the wilderness and lives just in communion and prayer with, with, uh, with Christ. And she says, I was never so happy when I had all these worldly goods as I am now. Whereupon she tells Percival something quite shocking. She says, I have to tell you, your mother is dead. And although Percival is sorrowful, he also says something interesting, namely that the world will change. Everything changes, and we have to change with it. We have to change our lives to, to, to meet that change. And it's striking because the person who is involved in carnal desire or worldly joys has a very hard time with change. They can't accept the, the aging of their beloved or pain or sorrow or uh, death or, or any kind of disease. They can't accept that because it ruins the, the beauty of carnal joy. And Percival, whose temptation now is going to be carnal joy, is already in a position where he's going to be able to handle it because he's saying everything changes. We can't hang on to anything, and thus, even with carnal joy, we can't say, stop, you are so fair. We have to move with changes and see humans as humans who are also subject to time and suffering and pain. Well, his aunt goes on to reveal something also about the round table after telling him about his mother. And she says that uh, Merlin, when he first formed the round table, formed it for a specific purpose. And she says this, 
Merlin made the round table in tokening of roundness of the world, for by the round table is the world signified by right, for all the world, Christian and heathen, repair under the round table. And when they are chosen to be of the fellowship of the round table, they think them more blessed and more in worship than if they had gotten half the world. And ye have seen that they have lost their fathers and their mothers and all their kin and their wives and their children for to be of your fellowship. It is well seen by you, for since ye have departed from your mother, ye would never see her. Ye found such fellowship at the round table. And when Merlin had ordained the round table, he said, By them which should be fellows at the round table, the truth of the San Graal should be well known. And men asked him how men might know them that should best do and achieve the San Graal. And then he said, There should be three white bulls that should achieve it, and the two should be maidens, and the third should be chaste. So first Merlin, according to the aunt, has created the round table like the roundness of the world. The, the table represents the world, and like a microcosm inside of that macrocosm, the various members of the round table have left the world to come to the round table, and they find in the round table a fellowship that they never had in the world. But the whole point of the round table, Merlin says, was to get the grail, was to achieve the grail, was to show the rest of the world what it meant to be truly human. It wasn't just to go get a cup, you know. It wasn't just to go get some styrofoam cup or something. Uh, it was to achieve that perfection of human existence so that they could then show the rest of the world what it meant to be happy and what it meant to be noble and what it meant to be powerful. Um, and those who would achieve it, he says, are three white bulls, three men who are uh, symbols of strength and power. The virgin, the unbroken one, the one who uh, had never known carnal love, was going to be uh, this guy here, um, Percival. And uh, this character would be the first of the three, and the second would be Bors, who is chaste, that is living a life of chastity, and the third would be Virginal, who was Galahad. And so Merlin said those are the three who would achieve the grail. And then the aunt says to Percival, you must go to the castle of Carbonac, and there heal the maimed king. That's what you have to do. And your job is to go out into the world to cure people, to heal them. And so Percival goes out with a renewed, a recharged sense that this is what he's about. But then in a battle, he loses his horse. And he's very mad because he can't get further without his horse. And so in an anger, he falls asleep, which is very similar to Lancelot's magical falling asleep. It's like a spiritual sleep where he, um, he stops on the quest or pauses on the quest. And when he wakes up, He's confronted by a woman who speaks to him very fiercely, uh, uh, almost an um, uh, overbearing, overpowering woman in, there at, at night time. So it's night and he's on this open plain and his horse is dead. And this woman says, take my horse. And if you notice the language, the language is filled with this sort of aggressive and um, overbearing femininity that, that she wants him to take her horse. And he marvels at the power and strength of this horse, this big black horse, and gets on top of it. And he rides across this dark uh, plain. And you've got to picture it. It's it, the dark plain at night on a black horse. Notice, black with black and black and barren. Well, I think that this image is very much an image of that carnal desire, uh, the, the desire of the, of the world, the desire of the body. It's like riding out of control on a dark horse over a dark plain. And Percival doesn't realize the danger he's in until he's already riding across that plane at breakneck speed.